can go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, you guys. Thank you for the band. Let's give it up for the band, you guys. Hey, my name is John Maroos. I'm the lead pastor here at Frontline. Thank you for visiting with us, especially if this is your first time. We're hoping for a great morning. We've got some great stuff planned for you. A couple quick things. First, uh, Pastor Gary and Susanna are in the house one last time. Yeah, one last time. You guys stand up. Where are you at? Yeah, I got you. One last time, Gary. Hey, we love you guys. I mean that. They're flying out tomorrow um, to start an awesome adventure, a new adventure. So we're super excited. Make sure you love on them, of course, as always, before you go. And uh, one, one other quick thing. If you're a part of our children's ministry team or you would like to step into that, we, had, we have had a lot of volunteers in the last two weeks. We do have a meeting today at 1 o'clock right here in this room. And I want to update you because... These guys keep breaking records in there with attendance. Uh, we uh, Yeah, you might as well. That's, it's exciting. <clears throat> it's not a burden at all. It's a miracle that we get to, to love on your kids and, and to uh, tell them about Jesus Christ as well. We pray this is a season that will change their life. They'll look back when they're 30 or 40 and say, I was in Ramstein, Germany, and, and man, God did this thing in my life as a little person. But we are growing so much that we need to start talking about our volunteer team and building that up. So please, if you are a part of that team or you want to be a part of our kids' team, or just come and check it out, see what we're doing. I'm going to throw some big ideas at you, and we're going to have some fun right here at 1 o'clock, but I need you here, all right? All right, are you ready? New series today, starting today, you guys. If you do have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. We do have Bibles down here. You can have one after our gathering, after our service today. I will put all the verses up behind me. I'll make them simple to understand for you. And I would encourage you also to take some notes, write down some stuff, and uh, journey together, as Chris said, in a small group or whatever ministry you're involved in. Uh, go through this together. We're going to be on a three-week journey talking about joy. How many of you guys would love some joy, some more joy in life? All right, I think so. Me too, me too. And we're not talking about bumper sticker joy. I'm talking about real, real, raw, powerful joy that will get you through. That's what we want to talk about. So the series is entitled, A Rebel's Fight for Joy. A Rebel's Fight for Joy. And the concept is, we're just going to have to come to a place, guys, when we rebel against certain cultural norms and certain narratives, that was an amen, don't worry about it, certain cultural narratives that are telling us the wrong message and start fighting against those messages and believing in what God says to unlock some joy. And we're going to meet a man, the Apostle Paul. I'll tell you a little bit about him. And uh, he is going to unlock a secret for us with this thing of joy. We're going to talk about our thought life, joy in our thought life today, joy in our thought life. You can write that down. Uh, we had a great time at our 8.30, so I'm anticipating great breakthroughs for you. Now, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, thank you for coming, seriously. I was in your shoes. At uh, 20 years old, I walked into a church, 21, something like that. <clears throat> and uh, uh, one of my curiosities was, what is Christianity going to do for me? I certainly didn't go from one form of bondage, of drinking and fighting and literally throwing my life away to enter another element of bondage with religion. And so when I found this truth in the Bible, I realized that following Jesus is something far more beautiful and greater than I ever dreamed. And it will change your life. So here we go. Life is hard. Can I just start by saying that? Can we just get that out of the way real quick? Uh, life is a, a hard journey. It's a beautiful journey. There's, there's, there's so many beautiful things woven into it, like a tapestry. But we need some type of baseline, foundational thing that, guys, when life gets crazy, especially if you're a young person, I want to talk to all of us, but especially if you're a teenager or you're a millennial, uh, man, you got to hear this because you're getting some really interesting narratives thrown at you. We need something that we can fall back on, a piece, when, when all hell is breaking loose around you. You know what I'm talking about? Whether it's a relationship or health or, or being away from home or your vocation or whatever's going on in your life, we've got to have something that sustains us, something that holds us up. Uh, I ask this every week, and we're getting a little stronger. Any Californians in the house? All right, if you're from Europe, I think everyone knows where California is. 
That's on the west side of our country. It's kind of a crazy place. Uh, unless you're from California, then I'm with you. I love you. But uh, I, I was pastoring in California for a decade or more, and uh, it's hot there. It's just hot. It's hot. That's it. It's hot. And so after church on Sundays, uh, I would go over to my mom. She was on staff with us, and she had an apartment, and we would go swimming in her swimming pool. And that water is like 80 degrees, you know, so you can imagine. Uh, it's just burning hot there. And me being Scottish, me and this son don't do too well all the time. So I would go into this pool, and our, our girls would go with us, and, and they were little, er, um, they weren't supposed to grow up, still don't know how to deal with that. But uh, our girls would go, and, and all the neighborhood kids would be in this pool. And you know how kids are when they're in a pool. They're a lot of fun, right? They're splashing. And I don't know who ever invented those noodles, but those are weapons of warfare. <laughs> so they're smacking dad, and they think it's fun. I'm too tired to respond, so I'm just floating. But kids are cannonballing, and then the neighborhood kids think I'm, like, having fun with my kids hitting me, so they're hitting me. It's just chaos. chaos. It wasn't helping a bit. So, so what I would do is all this, check this out. I'm talking about joy. All this chaos on the surface. I would hold my breath, and I would just sink down to the bottom. And I, I would look up, and I could still see all the chaos. But there was this, this quietness as I was under that water. And there was this peace. I was just watching everything around me. Nothing had changed up there, but I had changed my position. I had changed my experience, and I was feeling this sense of peace. Now, the problem was I could only hold my breath for about 60 seconds. <laughs> so literally, on the bottom of a pool floor, laying there, thinking about this in a 60-second moment, it hit me, this is what joy is like. Joy is like when all of life is going chaotic and kids are, are crying and we're doing just normal life stuff and we're stressed out about what's going on in, in the world or we're dealing with issues, issues like sexual ethics and we've got these big questions wherever you're at in life. That's what it feels like. There's all this chaos. But God actually promises, God actually says, I can unlock that experience for you today. Like with all that going on, it'll be like you at the bottom of that pool, but you don't have to hold your breath. It's going to be a natural and powerful thing that happens in your life. So I wanted to find joy as, as simplified as I can today, and we're going to carry this for the next couple of weeks. So everyone write this down. We'll put it on the screen behind me. Here's what joy is. Joy is a state of contentment and peace from within. And what's crazy is no matter what's going on around you, you can have this, this sense and this state of contentment and peace even though all this chaos is happening around you. Now, the Bible actually says, if you're here and you're new to this, this, uh, this idea of following God, the Bible actually says that for those who are following Jesus, we actually have joy in us already. So we should be like super peaceful, pumped up people. You know what I'm saying? You, you guys who are followers of Jesus, you're like, yeah, help us out with that one. But here's what you have to do. You've got to unlock it and release it. There's actually something you have to do to allow God to then release it out into your life. Okay? And that's what I want to break down today. But I want to ask you, where, where does joy come from? Seriously, on a practical level, where are you trying to find joy? You don't even have to be calling it joy. You're just like, I just want rest or peace or, you know, some serenity or something like that. Whatever you're calling the state of peace when, when all is going wild around you, where do you look for it? This is not to beat anybody up in here, but I want you to finish this sentence because so often we're looking outside of us in this world, whether it's material things or a new job, those things are not necessarily wrong. But is it the way God unlocks joy? Write this down and finish this sentence just in your mind. Just think about this. Let's learn a little bit about ourselves. If I, if, I could, if I could just get, and then you fill in that blank, what is that for you? Then I'll feel peace. Like Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's kids. And these things are beautiful. Maybe it's vocation. Maybe it's travel. Maybe it's less work. Again, maybe that's going to be a piece of it. But I want you to think about that. What is that thing that you feel like if, if you could just get it? Because I, I want to I declare today that I have gotten almost all of it. And almost none of it has brought me any closer to joy. They're all good things. They make me happy temporarily. I read a Jim. Remember Jim Carrey? What happened to Jim Carrey? Where's Jim Carrey these days? I read a quote by Jim Carrey who hit the top. He says, I wish every single human being could be as successful as they ever want to be and as rich as they ever want to be so they can find out it does not bring joy. 
I was like, whoa. He also says, the scary thing about succeeding is you're always climbing the mountain to get to the top, but once you get there and nothing happens, it's a terrible and devastating downfall. So you're going like this, like, whoa, wait a minute, we're, we're like physical people, like, you know, we try to get these things to experience joy. Where does it come from? And if you think about it, our world is advancing so fast. I was cracking up one of our staff meetings, you know, people get these new gadgets and we'll be talking in our staff meetings and Siri jumps into our staff meetings. It was like, stay out of the staff meetings, Siri. But you've got technology moving, you've got cars advancing and their technology which means that if we could find joy from all of these material things advancing, wouldn't we all be full of joy by now? Well, it doesn't come from the outside. And I want you to meet a man who actually unlocked it. And what he's going to say, check this out, you guys. He's going to say, he's going to tell us this morning that very few people ever, ever unlock joy. And he actually says it's a secret. It's a secret on how you do it. You could be a 16-year-old in this room, and you could unlock the most satisfying, most explosive thing you'll ever know, joy. It's a secret. And so I'm going to unpack a little bit uh, of this book of Philippians. You You can go to Philippians 4 if you have a Bible. I'll meet you there in just a minute. I want you to meet a man who rebelled against all of the narratives, all of the ways in which we are to find life, peace, and joy, and he found a new way. So here's the scene very quickly. This is a book called Philippians. It's a letter, actually. Didn't have all these verse numbers. It was just a letter. Think of an email. And here's the behind the scenes of this letter. How many of you guys have been to Rome? I'm so jealous right now. How many of you guys, next time you go to Rome, will need a pastor to pray over your food and stuff? <laughs> Nobody raised their hands. <laughs> Honey, let's go to Rome by ourselves. <laughs> Paul is in Rome in the first century. Think about that. You're tangibly like walking the area he was in. And I want you to visualize this. He's in Rome, and maybe he's on the outskirts of Rome, and there's lines of houses, neighborhoods, dusty streets, a lot of togas. <laughs> and, uh, and I want you to walk down that street, and as you, as you see this ro- these rows of houses, I want you to pinpoint in your mind's eye one. This one doesn't look like any different than the rest, but, but the reason you look at this one is because there's a soldier There's a soldier standing outside the door, and he's armed, and he's not playing at all. And the reason he's guarding that door is because there's a man inside who's who's threatening so much of Roman society by unlocking these secrets. And so you make your way in, you slip by the guard, you slip through the back door, and, and as you enter that, that little house, it's, it's a small house, and there's just a desk in the living room, and, and there's Paul. He's an early church leader. He's, he's, he's the general, if you will, and he's sitting at a desk, and he's, he's got an old parchment, and he's got a, uh, a little jar of ink, and he's got ink-stained hands, and he's got scar tissue all over him. He's a crooked, he's a crooked man in his 60s. His eyesight is failing him. He's got candles burning, even though it's midday. And as you walk into that house and you walk up behind Paul, you hear a conversation outside the door. And, and all of a sudden, the Roman guard, he opens the door, and this man staggers in, and he looks, he looks awful, you guys. He's, he's sick. He's gaunt. He's pale, and he's got a bag. And he says, Paul, I made it. And Paul grabs a hold of him, and you're watching the whole thing, and he, he lays him down on a makeshift hay bed, and the man's name is Epaphroditus. Don't name your kid that. Epaphroditus. That's a, that's a mouthful. And he lays him down, and, and Paul says, why are you here? And, and he says, well, I'm from the, the church in Philippi, Macedonia. I'm from, I'm from a church out there, Paul, and, and Paul knows that church well. And he says, he says, what are you doing? He says, we're struggling, and we need you, Paul. We need you so bad, and we brought you some money. We brought you some supplies. We know you're, you're under arrest here, but we need your help so bad. And this man, Epaphroditus, kind of, he throws his arm out. It's like he's almost dead, and he's got a letter in his hand from, from the, the followers of Jesus in Philippi. And, and Paul tells him to rest, and he goes back to his desk, and he, he unrolls the letter, and he begins to read it. And he sees that these guys are full of pain and problems, and they've lost their joy. Anybody, anybody in that place this morning? They've lost their joy. And he says, rejoy. He goes, re-up your joy. Let's re-up our joy. And what's so amazing is he grabs the bag and he opens it up and it's full of money and books and parchments and clothes. And here's what Paul says. He's a tricky dude. 
I think he was hard, he was very hard to deal with. Because in Philippians 4, verses 16 and 17, we'll put it up behind me, he, he's writing back. This is the actual letter that he wrote back to this church when Epaphroditus got healthy. He rolled his letter up, gave it to him, and he goes, in that letter are the secrets to unlocking joy forever. Don't lose that letter. Get back there quick. And so he writes in this letter, verses 16 and 17, even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. So he goes, like, you Philippians, you, you followers of Jesus and Philippi, you've always helped me. You've always watched my back. Now, remember, the guy who brought the money to Paul, he's laying there almost dead. And Paul goes like this, not that I really needed it. Like, come on, are you serious? This guy almost lost his life, and Paul's like, hey, really appreciate it, but I'm, I'm actually good where I'm at. And you're just thinking to yourself, dang, what, what, what led him to that? He says in verse 17, not, not that I seek the gift, not that I need it, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I, I don't really need it, but I hope you're blessed by it, by giving to me. And you think, what, what's gotten into this man? Look at 412. Here's what's gotten into this man, you guys. This is what you can have this morning. He goes like this. Here's why I'm good, where I'm at. But dude, you're locked up. Who's really in prison, the Roman guard or Paul? Look at verse 12. I know how to be brought low. I know how to get rocked. That's what he says. And I know how to abound. By the way, if you don't know how to go low and how to go high, either are dangerous. Man, prosperity is dangerous and suffering is dangerous if you, if you can't unlock the secret to joy. In any and every circumstance, I love what he says here. I had to learn. There was a process that I had to go through so I could unlock the secrets of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, and just being okay. I had to learn how to unlock the secret. So I'm going to give you the first piece to the secret today. In the next two weeks, I'm going to give you two other secrets on how to unlock joy. Does that sound like a deal? All right, here we go. Here's, here's the first thing that Paul does to unlock this joy. Write this down. We'll put it up behind me. Man, I love this topic. This one changed my life. Paul learned how to control his thought life to experience joy. Okay, write that down. Put it on a phone. <clears throat> Some of you guys, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, uh, a lot of you guys no doubt studied psychology. You'll, you'll recognize the term cognitive therapy. Jesus was doing that a long time ago, a long, long time ago, with another element of spirituality that blew people's minds. Look at 4.8, uh, Philippians 4.8. Here's what he says. He's writing this big old email, and he goes like this in verse 8. Finally, brothers, which is to say this is the most important thing that you could walk away with. If you remember anything that I write today, please get this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, man, think about those things. Grab a hold of those things. You got to get those things in your mind. Guys, the average mind in this room thinks 30,000 thoughts in one day. I don't know. That's a 60-page book a day that we write right up here. 30, some of you guys double that number. 30,000 thoughts in a day. Now, don't write this down. Don't worry about this. But Proverbs 23, 7 says this. For as a person thinks, so he is. 30,000 thoughts are running through our minds every single day, and we're becoming them. You cannot, you cannot separate action and thought. It's impossible. I'll prove it to you through Dumbo and my daughter. <laughs> I think my oldest daughter was five or six or seven or eight or something like that. I don't know, and she was watching Dumbo, and uh, uh, in, the, in the beginning, I'm going to butcher this parent, so I, I love you, don't, don't throw anything at me, Dumbo, I think Dumbo's mom dies or something, and it's, it's really tough stuff, and, and they start kind of being rough with Dumbo, my daughter's sitting on the couch with an ear-to-ear grin, just like loving the movie, and then they start hurting Dumbo, my daughter, who is, is a super chill girl, leaps off the couch, and she doesn't hit the TV, she smites the TV, she's just like, da. And I'm just like, no. <laughs> My wife's like diving for the remote, like turning it off. We've never watched Dumbo again. <laughs> no. What just happened? 
Thought became action. Thought became action. Now, this is not to hurt you, to criticize you, or anything else. But if you're, if you're watching your behavior patterns and you're not happy with where you're going with your actions, it's because of what's going on up here. You actually can't just stop acting a certain way. You have to stop thinking a certain way. By the way, see, if you're not a follower of Jesus, like, this is how amazing Christi- this thing of Christianity is. This is how amazing it is to follow God. He works in these ways. So we are becoming whatever is loudest in our minds, guys. Whatever's vo- who, whoever's voice is loudest in our minds. And we've got all these messages moving through our minds, whether it's our parents or, or you know, you're still thinking about what you were told as you were growing up uh, by a parent or something like that, by culture, all the messages that we download from culture about who we are, about what it looks like to be beautiful or successful or where you should be at 23, a business owner, two well-behaved kids, and a perfect marriage and a great car. Right? Poor millennials. You think about what religion is downloaded into your minds. You think about the eye gate, the things that we allow into our minds through the things we see, the ear gates. Uh, I grew up on Wu-Tang Clan and Tupac. Anybody with me? Uh, Anybody used to be with me? We don't want to be there anymore. To this day, I can't listen to any type of Christian rap because I'll get into a fist fight. Why? It brings me back. It brings me back. All these influences that are lodged in our minds, even today, the things we watch. I'm not, I'm not here to tell you not to watch TV or anything weird, but I'm saying like even, even the things we watch on Netflix and the messages we're downloading constantly, the earbuds, right? We all do it. I was uh, in the office, our church office behind Aldi, and I, I, I left the office writing this to pray for you guys. I mean that. To, I walked into the woods and prayed for you guys, and I was just thinking, the sun was out, and, and I was thinking about all this thing of how how we're being influenced every second by thought, all these downloaded thoughts and how they're creating action. And there was this little boy playing soccer. He was about eight years old, uh, back by this trail going into the woods, and, and he's having this amazing time. And I had this experience, so when I saw him, I just thought to myself, look at that little mind right there. He has no idea what's going on right there. All of these messages through TV and parents, some amazing, some not so amazing, but they're all telling him how far he's going to make it in this world. Because you can't go beyond your thoughts. Amazing stuff. And when we play those thoughts, the ones that are not healthy, that have been downloaded into us, when we replay them over and over and over and over for 15 years, they become reality for us. And there's some of us who have just been living a lie, things you've been told, and and those chains are going to break today. Anybody ever seen Rogue One? That's a good one for the mind. Or I got to get my heart right, one of the two, I don't know. But in Rogue One, you guys know the, the Asian guy who's blind, he's like a Jedi. He's not a Jedi, but he's like a Jedi. Best character in the whole movie, I love that guy. So he's in, he's in jail with, with the pilot, and the pilot's so frustrated and angry in his mind and his thoughts, and he just wants to get out so he can avenge himself. And, and this, this blind, somewhat Jedi guy, he just pulls the Jedi movie, he just looks over at him as, as this guy's got... The prison bars and, and the Jedi guys just chilling, kicking back. And the Jedi looks at him and he goes, there is more than one sort of prison. I sense that you carry yours wherever you go. He's talking about his mind. You, you couldn't lock Paul up because you couldn't beat his thoughts. That's awesome. So write this down. I love this thought. This is one of my family mottos. We literally say this to each other quite often. Write this down. We need to start thinking about what we're thinking about. 30,000 thoughts, are we even aware of what's going on? <laughs> Woke up this morning, I just didn't feel right. Didn't feel, I feel great now, but I didn't feel right. My, my, just my, my psyche, I just, ugh. And I had, to, I had to get intentional and say, John, what are you actually thinking on? And I realized that I was thinking on all these lies, all these lies. And it was bending my emotions, it was bending my action. I was already telling myself what was not going to go right today. And I had to battle against that. If, if 30,000 thoughts are winging through our minds, we've got to really be intentional about what we're thinking about. And we, we just cannot entertain thoughts about us or our situation that God does not think about us or our situation any longer. We've got to stop listening to ourselves and start allowing God to tell us the truths that he has, the victories he has, who we are as his people. And if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, the same goes for you. Like the songs we sang, like you need to hear God tell you that he wants you and the things he can do in your life. We got a lot of teachers in here, so I got to be super careful. 
I feel like I, I owe you guys a lot for my childhood. Terrible. Uh, I'm not a big math guy at all. Well, I wasn't really a big school guy. <laughs> Young people, that's not a good thing. Don't say, I'm following Pastor John on that one. But I was thinking about this for a long time. I was thinking about my mind because I was so, I just wanted joy again. This was years ago. And I actually wrote down a math equation, and I want you to try to solve it. You've got six seconds. Let's put it up behind me. That'll change your life right there if you, if you can solve it. Part two next week, let's pray. Right thinking over time equals joy. Right thinking over time equals joy. You know, life is so complicated, I have tried to narrow down all that I do just by fixing my thought life because all of life comes from my thoughts. So we can almost try to simplify things, whether it's a, a problem in a relationship or anxiety. If we, if we focus on the core, the engine, the mind, right thinking over time equals joy. Look at Philippians 4.8 one more time. He goes, finally, brothers, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, look at the word whatever. How many times is he going to say it here? Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Here's what he's implying. The things in verse 8, all those beautiful things, Paul is implying that they're in every single situation and they are in you. No matter what you're going through, find it. Find it. Find the thought. Find the thought. How many of you guys love uh, thrifting? You guys been down to that one in uh, France? Like that big old one? Uh, we'll talk later. No worries. So if you like thrift stores and thrifting, I'm still trying to figure that out. Here's, here's what we do. We need to thrift when it comes to thoughts. We have all this, this I don't want to call it junk, but it's too late. We have all this junk, like two stories of junk in these thrift stores, and what do we do? We go through and we go, yee, yee, how'd that get in here? Oh, man, no, that's not, no, 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 no. And then we go, whoa, there it is. Oh, dude, look at that. And we grab it and we're like, oh, man, forget all this other junk. I'm, I'm holding on to this. Like, I'm not putting this down. Someone else is going to grab it. Someone else is going to get this thing. That's what Paul is saying. There's all this junk. There's, there's enough to focus on that's not right, that's negative, that's hopeless. There's all these lies going on in our heads. There's all these messages. That's enough. We need to thrift thought. We need to say, what's good and beautiful in my situation? Because if God is real, it's there. If God is real, it's there. I'll tell you a story about that next week that blew my mind. A true miracle happened in my family this week. Find it, Paul says. Find it. And then he goes, at the last part of, of verse 8, he goes, when you find it, grab it and do not, do not let go. He goes, think on these things. Literally dwell on them. Like, find what's good in the job. Find what is still good in the marriage. Find what is good living in Europe. Find what is still good in the vocation. Yeah, I know there's all kinds of junk to it all. But find that which is good. Grab it and never let go of that thing. And dwell on it and dwell on it until it becomes a new way to think, a new habit of thought. Every single thought speaks of allegiance to God or allegiance to some crazy lie. Both are empowered when we agree. We're either agreeing with lies or we're agreeing with what God says about who we are, what's going on in our situation, whatever it is. I woke up this morning and I had all this crazy stuff in my head about this sermon. Like, ah, no one's going to like it and it's not going to make sense and all this stuff. And I had to stop myself and, and, and tell myself, you're agreeing with all the lies in your head right now. What does God say is going to happen today? He'll never leave me nor forsake me. Anytime we open this book, it always does what it's designed to do. There are people at Frontline who love you, who care about you. We're a family together. I cast all the junk away and I got a hold of that which is good and I worked it into my mind over and over again. And it was amazing the release of joy I had. So I said it last week, I say it this week as well. It's time, guys, it's just time to start speaking to ourselves instead of listening to ourselves. And we just listen to ourselves way too much. And I'm so negative in the morning. The messages I tell myself, like this day's, it's all falling apart. It is never all falling apart ever because of my God. We need to let God start telling us the things about our lives and our world. I don't have this on, on the screen, but I want to I read one other place this is a very military-driven verse. In, just write this down in 2 Corinthians 10. 
verses 4 and 5. Paul says, if you want to fight for joy, if you want to rebel and fight and get this joy and unlock it, the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. We're not going to get material stuff. We're not going to be able to use anything physical to release joy. But you got divine power, he says. You've got power in you to destroy strongholds. Here's what he's saying. Every time we believe the the thoughts that don't align with God and what he says, whether it's about who we are or a situation, it's like we, we, we put a brick down. And then another thought, we put a brick down and a brick down and a brick down and a brick down. And just like these beautiful German castles, we start building this stronghold around our thoughts that nothing can get in and we get trapped in there. And Paul goes, you don't got to get trapped in there like we sang today. Why don't we kick a giant hole right through that wall and destroy all this junk and let God renew our thoughts and be victorious, joyous people? He says in verse 5, we destroy these arguments. We destroy the lies in our heads and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. He's like, oh, all these lies in your head? Ah, no, no, no. Let God crush all those lies And he goes, take every thought captive to obey Christ. It literally means to hold a spear. Paul's going like this. Every thought that comes into your mind, you go like this. Why are you here? You ain't getting in yet. Why are you here? Yeah, that's a spear. I'm not playing anymore. Life's too short. Why are you here? Anxiety, anger, fear. What does my God say about this? What does my God say about this? Now watch this. We'll close shop. Look what he says in Philippians 4, 9. You say, man, I need some of this. Let me unlock this. He says in 4, 9, here's here's what can happen today. What you have learned. What did we learn today, guys? And received. What did you just receive today in the last 30 minutes? And heard and seen in me. Practice these things. Let's get to work. Let's start this morning. Let's start fighting off these these erroneous thoughts, and start letting God speak into our minds, remember what he says, and what's going to happen? And then the God of peace. Man, you will feel him in your soul. You will feel his presence. You will feel his joy overwhelm you when you renew the mind. I say we start today. I say, I say we start this morning. What is that thought? What is that thought you've battled with? Whether it's about who you are or your situation, let's attack it. Let's flank it. Let's run it out. And let God fill our minds with what he says. It's time to be free. Would you bow your heads just just for a moment? I want to pray for us. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know where you're at with this, this message you heard with thoughts. Maybe it's something you've been told about who you are. Maybe it's things like you just can't get it out of your mind that you're a failure. It's hindered you from doing great things. Maybe it's with a situation. Maybe it's with a relationship. Has that thing become impossible to you? Is that what's going on in the mind? I want you to cast it out. And I want you to hear what God says. God says you are loved always. God says you are his poem, written on his heart. God says you are in his family. You always belong. God says you are valuable, so valuable that I sent my son to be be slaughtered for you. God loves you. God wants to do great things with you. Let those thoughts take over. And if it's a situation... God says, you have no idea the things I have prepared for you. You you do not understand the power that I have. You You do not understand my timing. But what you do understand is that I am for you and it is all gonna come together. In my wisdom, in my way, in my timing, do not fear. I will provide. Let those thoughts invade your mind and take over and work them. We're about to sing a song in a minute. And this is our way of renewing our minds, putting thoughts that are victorious and powerful into our minds. I want you to feel joy come back this morning. Father God, I pray this song that we're about to sing about joy would trump and take over and destroy any stronghold, any lie that is in our minds. And if you are for us, then who cares who is against us? We are more than conquerors.
conquers.